Welcome to Transmission, a weekly show about the most impactful posts from our Meteor JS forums. My name is Paul Dowman, founder at OK Grow, and each month I am joined by Sashko Stubilo and other guests from the Meteor Development Group. Please note the contents of this show are the sole opinions of their authors. This show is sponsored by Meteor Galaxy Hosting, a containerized cloud service specifically designed and engineered for Meteor app deployment. Learn more at meteor.com slash galaxy. This show is also sponsored by OK Grow, an official Meteor Prime consulting partner building full stack web and mobile apps. Learn more at okgrow.com. Hello everybody and welcome to episode number 12 of the Transmission Show. The point of the show is to talk about things that have been going on in the Meteor forums and uh, there have been a few interesting things happening lately. The most interesting thing, I think, um, measured by number of views and comments and just my uh, personal opinion is actually Meteor 1.4. So you guys just announced, me uh, you guys just released Meteor 1.3, like it feels like, I mean, it's, it can't even be more than four weeks. And, uh, and, and now we have Meteor 1.4 coming. So um, some of the big things in there, uh, and not to, not to spoil Zol's Thunder, because I want to hear about all these, but we've got Node 4 support, um, which is a pretty big update. We've got um, Mongo 3.2 support and running Mongo 3.2 in development mode, and, mm -hmm. and it relaxes the core package version restrictions. So let's, let's talk about all those things. Um, so, so first of all, um, node support. Um, uh, Benjamin did a talk uh, at, um, at Meteor Night about this, and I think that was uh, something that probably a lot of people have seen. But something that, was, that I noticed in your um, post on the forums was that uh, because the, the, there's pre-built binaries on, on Atmosphere, they've got a dependency on specific nodes, node version. So can you explain what that is all about and tell us how it affects developers and especially package authors? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when you build a uh, binary library, you're um, sort of uh, exposing an interface there for the node interpreter to use. Um, and that interface is, is changed between node versions. So um, packages that are built um, to a specific architecture, um, for example, OS X, uh, Linux, or also, it turns out, um, this is even more infrequently talked about, built for a specific um, major version of Node. Um, and so that's why um, if we were to simply you know, bump the Node version and, and call it a day, then what we would find is packages that happen to include um, binary dependencies, which is not every package. Um, it's only a sort of smaller subset. Um, we just break at runtime uh, when you included them in a Meteor app. So I, I remember um, back when, when this decision was being made, there was, there was some sort of talk, uh, pros and cons about it. And I'm, I'm curious if you could remind me what the, why, why it was building on, on Atmosphere. Was it is to support versions of, or architectures that you, that you don't have yourself? Was that the reason? Um, so there was a decision made with Meteor um, to say, hey, um, we want to make the developer experience as easy and as smooth as possible. Uh, and that means that we're not going to force de app developers to install a compiler toolchain on their machine, uh, which then sort of follows on that um, instead what we'll do is we'll provide um, a way for Atmosphere packages to include pre-compiled um, binary dependencies in them. Um, and as it turns out, <laughs> that means that uh, we uh, and package authors have collectively signed up for a pretty big task because now if um, we were to say, hey, we're going to stick with this same um, system going on indefinitely, we would now have to ask package authors um, to recompile their packages for um, you know, every version of Node um, across every architecture. And of course, we, we've helped out in the past by providing build machines. Um, that means you could SSH in, log in, and, and, and it would make it easier for you. 
But it's still, you can imagine, a pretty unscalable, or pretty hard to scale task going forward. Um, the other thing, so, so there's mm -hmm. that. Um, so then that means, okay, well, let's say we flip it around and we now ask um, developers to install a tool chain on their machine. Turns out that's pretty easy to do um, on OS X and Linux. At least it's a little bit harder under Windows. Um, but it's still sort of it still sort of may impact a really beautiful sort of first time experience, especially for for newer developers. Um, so we've we've found a good compromise, we think, where um, Meteor, uh, uh, when you install Meteor, the packages that it depends on, such as Fiverr, Vcrypt, um, and there are some others that include binary dependencies, will make sure that they come with pre-compiled binaries. Um, right, so you'll be able to still have a great out of the out of the box experience with Meteor without having a tool chain, but we will from uh, 1.4 onwards ask um, you know sort of more experienced developers with like larger, more real world style apps to 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 install a tool chain. Um, okay, as long as they're using packages that have binary dependencies, which they may not even be using, so. So this is just, I assume this is just as simple as if you're on a Mac, making sure you have Xcode installed. If you're, if you're on Linux, make sure you have GCC or whatever. That's right. Yeah, yeah the, only, the only time it gets a little bit confusing is uh, some like relatively obscure packages uh, might require special versions of like Visual Studio on Windows. But I think that's, I think my last experience with this was like trying to recompile MongoDB or something. So I think most NPM packages have pretty, uh, you know, or, or media package is a pretty simple requirement. So if you mm -hmm. just install like Visual Studio Express or something like that, which is free, uh, then you should be good to go on Windows as well. Yeah. Right. And it turns out there are mechanisms uh, in Node. Um, <coughs> one of those is called Node Pre-Jib. That gives uh, Node package authors the, the ability to pre-build um, binary dependencies for their own packages. And in the case that they've done that, um, of course, you won't need a tool chain either if you, you have a media package that yeah, I think this is one of the things that kind of, like you can bring some of the Meteor like atmosphere package experience into NPM once you start using some of these tools like Node Pre-Jip, yeah. uh, some of the other tools we're working on to make NPM package development better. Okay, cool. So it's got nothing to do with, with being able to deploy to a different architecture than what you're developing on or anything, I assume. Exactly. It just means that it'll deploy, it will build on whatever machine or system that you deploy to as well. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Okay. Um, well, actually, that that brings me to something else that was interesting in in this release announcement, and that was about relaxing the core package version restrictions. So, um, so that that's kind of like I guess you could describe this as the package versions being decoupled from the release version, right? So you don't necessarily have to have Meteor 1.4 uh, yeah. with with all of the exact versions of it. You could actually just update Blaze or update some other component on its own. Yeah. So what does that mean for future versions of Meteor? Like, will there still be, will there be a 1.5? Oh, absolutely. We anticipate there to be future versions of Meteor. Um, this is something we've been wanting to, or talking about doing for a while. So rather than when you have Meteor version 1.3.1.1 in your release file, um, right now that specifies a very exact, like, a, 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 completely exact version of every single core package. And we want to relax that to a version range um, that makes it possible to use a Sember compatible um, package um, with, uh, with your project. And even, in fact, to be able to um, edit that version range as a user if you really, really want to use a completely different version than your version, uh, you, know it's, you know it's going to be OK for you. Um, we've sort of realized that there's really no reason, I think, to, to have versions pinned that specifically. It's, in fact, more useful to be able to sort of override that as an end user. OK. So, you, so mm -hmm. I, you know, as a developer, I would still install Meteor 1.5. That would be whatever versions you guys felt kind of worked together or whatever. But I could, exactly. I could update something if I wanted to. Exactly. OK. OK. That's, that's cool. Um, so back. Uh, yeah, sorry, I said, yeah, one thing that will be super exciting is uh, for people who are contributing to Meteor, you'll no longer have to wait until the next actual Meteor release to see your bug fixes shipped, right? Mm -hmm. We can have a process where you just submit a bug fix and publish that immediately. 
Okay, that's really awesome. Yeah. I think it was really frustrating. Like some releases, like between 1.1 and 1.2, I think there was actually like just several months where, mm -hmm. you know, there were bug fixes that were marked as fixed, but you couldn't quite use yet. Uh, and that was yep. definitely pretty frustrating. And now that won't be a problem. Yep. Oh, that's, that's actually really cool. And, and also when it comes to th uh, things like React, where they have their own release cycle and whatever, and there's some core packages that, that use them. So you can just, uh, you can uh, update those packages and That's release right. those, and then we can we can pull that in without having to yeah. uh, have pull in a whole new version of release, a whole new release of Meteor that has to have every package gone through a whole testing process, etc. Exactly. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Cool. Um, so, and and I think this also opens up uh, the way for some core packages to not be maintained by you guys a hundred percent. So, I mean, things like Blaze come to mind. So. Um, is there anything that you guys have specific plans for? Like Blaze, for example? Uh, Blaze is the one that we've been really thinking the most about. Um, there are potentially some other ones, like you know, maybe the less package. You know, maybe there are people that are more passionate about the current state of less or have you know, a, a closer to it than we are. Yep. Um, other packages that we've been thinking about are accounts-related packages. Um, yeah, one of the things I've been really excited about is just uh, <laughs> There's some people who are doing really crazy stuff with accounts, and I mean crazy in a good way. Like uh, the Rocket Chat team has like 17 different login packages now yep. that are probably way better than what we have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, do you guys think that something like accounts would be entirely community supported at some point? I think it's probably a matter of there's 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 in my mind more because <clears throat> sorry, you're Zol's one's actually in charge. But I was gonna <laughs> say what I was gonna say anyway. Um, there's there's certain parts of it that I think are like more critical and less critical. Um, so making sure that accounts is secure, uh, making sure that you know it does the right thing, it doesn't you know do something that you don't want. I think that's definitely uh, going to be our responsibility for a long time to make sure that you know you can feel safe using whatever accounts package you're using. Um, sure. But then there's a lot of kind of cosmetic features like you know what fields do you request from Facebook when you log in and like. Mm -hmm. You know, how does that work and how easy is it to set up that a lot of people are more excited about, I think. Right. That's right. And, and that does tie back to the package underpinning because um, being able to um, make it the responsibility of the community to maintain certain packages, um, you know, where, where there's you know, not as serious an impact as with the accounts package, um, we might actually be quite hands off with certain packages. Right. But that also means that, um, you know, Maybe the QA might not be as stringent as as we have. Maybe it, it, it might be better. Who, like who knows? But certainly, with unpinning the package versions, it'll make it possible for fixes to be shipped like overnight, you know, or whatever as required. Um, yep. in, in a way that doesn't like necessarily involve um, us, so that can happen much quicker. Yep. Um, yeah. One the one thing that's definitely been a factor in the past is that it does take a lot of effort to. <clears throat> Uh, because because releases are such a big deal, mm. it takes a lot of effort to kind of make sure that they're correct. Um, we used exactly. to go through like week long processes where we would like test every single login provider and every single browser. Mm -hmm. uh, and the best part about this unpinning thing is if we don't have to go through a whole release to fix a small bug like that, then we can shorten our release cycle significantly because it's not as catastrophic to release something that might have a small bug, right? Because people will notice, right. they'll tell us, we'll fix it in a day, and like, it'll be great. Yeah, exactly. Right, yep, and I've definitely seen uh, threads and posts on the, on the forums about people who are much more passionate about a very specific small package or whatever, so I think that's, that's great. Um, well, speaking of community support, so I understand that Mongo 3.2 support in, in the new Meteor 1.4 was pretty community driven. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? Yeah, so I, I would I would call that as a small success story that we've had in the last month. So um, we had a feature. Uh, so I, I don't know if you saw, we sort of revised our roadmap and, and made that um, mo you know up, both up to date and accurate, um, and also something we're committing to to keeping up to date accurate and accurate for the short to medium term future. And what we um, sort of said in the roadmap is like, hey, this is the stuff that we're definitely working on. Um, and you know, should there be contributions um, in these areas, we'd we'd really happily accept like PRs and work with the community. So that that, that was the first thing that we did, uh, and then to sort of 
um, stay true to that, the next thing we did was we realized that the Mongo 3.2 update, there were parts of it that um, didn't necessarily require like a serious level of familiarity with the, with the Meteor core code base. And so we thought, hey, like how, how about we you know, inspect this out um, lightly, um, use our experience to sort of drive um, the way we'd like to see it developed and, and what we know are the various sort of moving pieces and put, put it out there through the forums, uh, make a GitHub issue to track it and, and see what turns up. Uh, and then lo and behold, someone um, from the community, Fabs actually, um, from down in Brazil, was like, hey, I'm you know, between jobs at the moment, you know, I'd love to, I've always wanted to contribute to Meteor, this looks like something I could do. And then that kicked off a beautiful collaboration um, between us here and Fabs um, you know, on, on working on that feature. He, he did the bulk of the work, he asked us um, for, for input, where he got stuck, where he needed feedback, and that was just, I don't know, I think that for me that was just a huge win in terms of it leverage sort of everyone's strengths and time in the best way possible to move the entire project forward. Um, and we definitely, definitely want to use that pattern more in the future to just build more stuff faster. Um, yeah. Awesome. That's that, that's I think that's really great. Honestly, that's been the I think the single biggest community uh, criticism of, of MDG ever has just yeah. been about community involvement. And I think this is a really awesome step. So you know, there's there's people that are passionate about the smallest things. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever published open source and and you see people commenting on some like specific line in your code, that's that's you know that you think okay, whatever. Why, why is someone even reading that particular line? Like, yeah. uh, you guys know, I mean, every, every line of your stuff is, is scrutinized, but I think it's really good to, to take advantage of, of people that are, that are passionate about very specific things. I just wanna, I just wanna plug uh, the role of the Transmission Podcast in this whole process, which right. was like, I remember having an, ap an episode back in the day uh, when people were right in the middle of this conversation of like, why isn't Meteor as good at uh, open source contributions, you know, why don't we leverage all of this excitement we have in the community and we had a really great episode. We had in the, in the next episode we brought Matt on, mm. uh, who was at the time kind of doing what Zola is now, like managing some of the development of the framework. And uh, we had a lot of really great conversations and feedback between people on the forums, uh, mm. the stuff we were talking about on the podcast. Um, so I definitely... I want to. I want to think that that helped out a bit. Like, yeah, this this podcast came from a thread that where where people were complaining about exactly that. So, yeah, and awesome. now we have you know we have dozens and dozens of contributors on the guide. Uh, made the docs a lot easier to contribute to, and there's this whole like issue yeah. triage process that Zola has set up. Yeah, it's like super awesome. Well, kudos to you guys for making that happen. That's that's really cool. Very yeah, cool. Thanks to people for giving us all the feedback about like how we can make it, like what the best way is to make it happen. Yeah, I'm participating. The issue triage thing has gone really well. <coughs> um, we have sort of a handful of people now like from the community contributing you know, each week, um, helping out with that. And that's just really the more folks that can help out, the better because, you know, it's not, it's not hard stuff, but it requires knowledge of the framework and it requires sort of patience and, and guidance, but it's, it's really high impact stuff. Yep. Uh, yeah, cool. So one more follow up about the community stuff and this all this decoupling and everything. It's just I, I imagine there's probably people that are that are concerned about the support of specific things, right? So somebody that uses Blaze maybe uh, maybe is, is wondering like, uh oh, this is this like a code word for they're just they're just gonna hand it off to somebody and, and not not maintain it. What what do you guys have to say to someone like that? Um I think I, I can certainly see where that fear might be coming from, but when you think about the amount of open source that we use every day, that we trust the community to build for us, Linux being a great example, I don't see that as being this like big like negative fear. In fact, I see it as, as being a very positive thing if it's well managed. Yeah. Um, and you know. MDG itself um, has limited resources as well, so we've been stretched pretty thin with all the stuff that we're doing. So I think folks that are worried um, should instead be wondering, oh wow, will Blaze actually move faster now and be in fact higher quality if there are more passionate contributors out there working on it that have been unable to do that in the past because of the way the project's been set up. So I think that's <laughs> actually the case, probably. I mean, there's Meteor is a huge project. All of the people that have used Meteor 
before very, very recently are using Blaze. Yeah. A lot of those people are super passionate about it. And I, I think, like, I mean, that Blaze just was the specific example that I that I pulled out. But I think f mm. for that one, I, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. Yeah, so what we're trying to do is refactor the both the project, so technically, sort of shuffling things around, like the unpinning, um, you know, package versions is an ex example of the technical work we're doing. And we're also trying to refactor the governance of the project and improve that in order to just make, you know, community contribution in a, in a high quality way, like a much easier thing to do. Yep. Because in the past, I think the project has suffered from both aspects. Yep. Yep. That's good. And I, I think people will even be more likely to contribute to it when it becomes a standalone project. Yeah. You can get really passionate about it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I think it'll be super exciting with some of the stuff that we're talking about, uh, kind of migrating onto NPM, which I think was, will be like the, I think, I, I feel like NPM is just a small part of what we're doing, but to me, it's the biggest <clears throat> sign of kind of, uh, trying to remerge with the general JavaScript community because mm -hmm. that's where people get their packages from. And so if, you know, if Blaze is on NPM, if live queries on NPM, uh, and people can start using that stuff, then I think the number of people interested in contributing to it and improving it is just going to skyrocket because, yeah. like, like, live query is freaking crazy. Mm -hmm. like, yeah, there's yeah still absolutely. Like and if you can use that without having the rest of Meteor as, as, you know, if you can use that in another project that's not even a Meteor project, that just opens up the world of people that are going to contribute it to, to it a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally believe that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I think this whole theme of, of moving to NPM is is like a, th a theme of the last six months and probably the next six. And I think it's the biggest deal that's that's happened in Meteor. So I'm super, super excited about that. Definitely. Um, and I, I think I just have one more question about this stuff. So um, if, if everything is moving to NPM packages eventually, um, what does that mean for the build tool? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, it's really something we're um, trying to wrap our heads around as well. Um, we, you know, Webpack is great. It's really fast. Um, it has, you know, fast hop uh, module replacement, also code splitting. So it has these great features and it's fast. Um, but there are some other um, features about like the bundle format, for instance, and debuggability and source map that we, we think Meteor does a better job of. Uh, and also, um, you know, maybe the way that like uh, loaders are specified in Webpack is, you know, maybe not ideal from from design standpoint. But anyway, um, I, I guess the higher point there is that we're not quite ready necessarily to throw the Meteor build tool out the window and say like, hey, like, you know, everyone should use Webpack now. Um, having said that, we do want some of the benefits that it brings. Um, the other complication, and this is sort of tied into moving over to NPM, is the, the way that the Meteor package format works. Turns out it's it's baked into very much the core of Meteor. It's one of the first things that was built, and then the rest of the framework was built up around it, and the package system was extended each time the framework needed some new piece of integration. So it's actually quite a significant um, design challenge to unbundle all of that and, and turn it into you know pure NPM packages, right? Um, so that's sort of a long-winded way of saying I, I can't really tell you right now what it means for the build tool. I think we envisage a future where maybe um, the build tool becomes maybe a standalone tool, um, and you know, Meteor itself kind of is, is split off into these more standalone tools. For instance, the um, packages, if they move to npm, well, the, the, that raises the question, can they be used in a Webpack project? And we would love, we would sure love for them to be used that way or independently, as in you just use live data. And then that begs the question, well, what about the build tool? Well, maybe maybe the build tool spins out into its own separate project as well and competes with, with Webpack, right? If we think that, right. you know, we can make it better. Um, if we realize that there's no reason to compete with it, maybe, maybe we, um, join forces with, with Webpack and take some of the improvements over there. Um, so these are all sort of, you know, maybe, you know, possible sort of ways we can go, but I, I, I can't tell you right now, which, which is. Yeah, I, I imagine it'll be obvious based on what, what people are using probably. So, I mean, if we, yeah. if we get to this NPM future and 
and nobody is everybody's using webpack anyway then i think it's it would be obvious but if there's still yep. some value um, and, and, and I want to I want to stress that we want to prioritize developer experience over like uh, you know not built here kind of syndrome. Um, so we're more than happy to um, to use other tools that um, you know that are that are work, working really well to give a great developer experience. Cool. Yeah, I think one thing that could be really cool is uh, bringing some of the stuff that we've learned about how great a developer experience can be with something like Meteor. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and bringing that either by creating a tool that other people can use or by bringing that to tools that already exist out there. Um, like I bet there's a lot of things that, uh, well by bet I mean like I'm, I'm pretty sure there are tons of things that Meteor does that A, people don't even know about and B, like don't think are possible. Mm -hmm. um, like for example, uh, just a, a kind of like super underappreciated feature I feel is like Meteor Shell, right? Right. Like yep. the fact that you can just uh, connect to your server and start running whatever code you want and have that autocomplete and stuff just like in your browser console, like that's not like something you get with other JavaScript platforms at all. Yeah. Like yeah. that's just not a thing. Um, the ability to, you know, have source maps on by default, have it automatically select production or development settings uh, at the right time. Like something really niche, like splitting style sheets into multiple files so that it runs on certain versions of Internet Explorer. Like, I don't know which which webpack loader you need to get that feature, right? Mm -hmm. Like, or, or maybe nobody even thought about it. Mm -hmm. um, and over four years, like, there's more and more of these things that I feel like we kind of take for granted at this point. Mm -hmm. But it took a long time to find all of those uh, edge cases and make sure that they work really well. So. Yeah, full stack <laughs> packages. So that I mean, I don't. I don't actually quite understand how that would work without, without the Meteor build tool, or actually even even on NPM. So, mm, mm. Um, is, is that all is that all figured out yet, or is this is this just a potential? Did you figure it out? Yeah, it's, I'd love to say it's all figured out, but I, I can't do that and be honest. It's um, it's not necessarily figured out. Awesome. And then the other, you know, the other sort of piece of the puzzle there is Apollo, which we're we're working hard on and. How does it fit into the picture? I mean, uh, you know, given the idea that we're, um, you know, going to open up um, access to more databases and backends through Apollo, it does raise the question of what is a full stack package and how far does it reach into the stack? So, yeah, there there are a lot of uh, a lot of questions left to answer. Yeah, but, but I think there's a great opportunity here. Like, just just a simple question of like, how do you ship? Uh, a package that includes uh, less less code, right? Exactly. So like a, a less file with variables and mixins. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think there's there's not a well defined answer for that right now in the NPM community. Like mm -hmm. the way that I, I almost take it for granted now in Meteor, where you can just install a package and you can import a variable from it, and like it's super simple. Mm -hmm. um, but having a, an experience like that in a more decoupled world, I think, is something that could be super valuable if we can figure out how to do it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't even count the number of things that Meteor has pioneered over the last four years. That the rest of the world, you know, a lot of them, the rest of the world have figured out and and done now. Like even hot code loading uh, at that at at the time when I first started using Meteor, it was amazing. It blew my mind. And so now other frameworks and things like Webpack are are doing it. But yeah, there's. There's those big obvious things, and then there's a ton of small things as well. Yeah. All right, cool. So um, I guess that's uh, a little bit of a segue to some of the other things that people have been talking about, mostly sort of revolving around this kind of opening up and less, uh, less opinionated nature of things. And so the next thread that I want to talk about with you guys is the Game of Thrones thread. Um, um, so and it's also a convenient point for me to uh, go to another meeting and step out of the room. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks for coming. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks for having me. It's been um, really great to chat. Um, and yeah, look forward to, to jumping on an episode in the near future. Awesome. Thanks, Zol. Hey. Right, thanks. Here. Right. thanks. Bye. Yeah, Zol's got like real work to do, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Um, so, I'm going on a three-week vacation on Saturday, so I, I don't really have any work. Oh, nice. Very nice. Wait, 
how, how do you figure that out? Because before I go on vacation, I'm super stressed out and working to the very last minute. So, <laughs> uh, it's more like I don't feel like I can start anything new because I'm not going to be able to finish Excellent. it. So all I'm doing is like talking to everyone to make sure that uh, you know nothing collapses while I'm gone. Awesome. But, uh, it's really exciting. Yeah, we we just got a, a bunch of interns, so I'm going to offload all my work onto that. So next time on transmission, it'll just be uh, the intern. Uh. That's your secret. That's how, that's how Sashko is everywhere at once. Yeah, I'll, 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 get, him, I'll get him a mask. They're all named Sashko. Yeah. <laughs> all right, so the Game of Thrones thread. So, um, so this post, uh, the author wants uh, some clear and opinionated direction about what to build, basically. Um, and, yeah. so, and so he says, there's no more Discover Meteor as, as the definitive guide for newbies coming to Meteor. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious what you guys think about that. <clears throat> I mean, yeah, well, it's, it's really interesting because um, I almost feel like last year, like literally 2015, was kind of like the biggest explosion of new technologies in JavaScript that I've ever experienced. Um, yeah, it was kind of dizzying, actually. <laughs> From yeah, my perspective. Like every every week there was like a new flux thing coming out in the middle of the year, like GraphQL and Relay came out. Uh, Redux started becoming a thing that people use. There were like many breaking changes in React. Um, it was really crazy. And I, at that point I was like, holy shit, like if this keeps happening, if 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 every year is like this now forever, uh, I think I'm just gonna have to like <laughs> go into a cave or something. Yep. Um, and so I think that's kind of reflected on Meteor because, you know, it's hard to have a super coherent experience in a world where what people might consider to be the best practices for JavaScript uh, are, are, are constantly shifting. Yep. Um, and I think that's what really what this thread is about is, you know, I think on the one hand, you know, we, we want to be a place that's a little bit more stable in the wider JavaScript ecosystem. On the other hand, what that means is, um, you know, a lot of people are also turned off by that because they show up to Meteor and they're like, okay, well, here's Meteor, like, how do I use all the tools that I learned were the best from my friends, from Hyper News, from the internet? Um, so that's definitely been pretty interesting uh, seeing how that goes. Yeah, there, there was a great response on that thread. Uh, I think it was on that one where, where somebody said, use what you know until you learn something better and then use that. So. Don't don't worry that there's something new that you don't know. So I I couldn't agree with that more. Um, yeah. Which which doesn't mean don't go try to learn new things, but you know and, until you learn that new thing, just keep using what you're using and you'll be fine. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty tough to do though, right? Because it's kind of like I almost feel like it's an ego thing where you don't really feel good if you're using something that you feel is not uh, is not up to date um, or it's not that good, right? It's like having an iPhone that's like two years old, like. <laughs> You know, your phone is still working and you can still take pictures, but, you know, it's not quite as new. It doesn't have, like, 3D touch or whatever. And, you know, you're like, when is the new iPhone coming out? Like, Yep. So, but, you know, one, one thing about this, this comment is that obviously there is the Meteor Guide. So I think that's your, that's, that's MDG's answer to, to this. I mean, as you guys are opening up uh, the, the code, you know, like um, allowing us to use React or Angular, and even relaxing the versions of the packages and all this stuff. At the same time, you're you're still providing kind of a structure. The original post, though, there's a comment in there where he says the guide is a mess of React and Blaze, and I'm, I'm wondering if you think that's fair or or true. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty interesting. Let me. I actually have this post up right now. Um, oh, it said. Uh, it said, well, so the, the actual sentence says, there is the Meteor Guide and the excellent tutorials, which are a mess of Blaze and React and different routers, which I think is, is I guess, accurate. Because if you, look at, uh, if you look at all the tutorials, all the example apps, there is a, quite a wealth of different recommendations. Like even yeah. you know, in the guide and the tutorial, I think we talk about Flow Router. And, and yet in the example app, we have React Router, um, just because of like the week that those things were written in, uh, <laughs> something like that. Um, yeah, I think it's it's pretty interesting. Like, I feel like last year it would have been impossible to. Okay, so to to start, I think it's like a real problem um, because 
I, well, I think that uh, from a technical point of view, um, I think Meteor should be as flexible as possible because you don't want to be coding yourself into a corner. I think you never want to start out with a tool and know like, oh crap, Like if I want to do a, a specific thing, I actually can't do that anymore, right? Like you don't want to start out using Meteor and code yourself into a corner where there's no way out. And so I think that's why the core needs to be as flexible as possible. Uh, there's no question about that. But then for people who, who don't want to be super creative about their technology choices, I think there isn't a good answer right now um, for how to just build an app from start to finish. Uh, I think the Meteor Guide is, is our entry in that, uh, in that space, but I think it's more philosophical than it is necessarily uh, like a, a copy and paste your way to success type of guide, um, which I think is actually something yeah. that's pretty necessary. I think our hope was that uh, you know by having a, a set of recommendations around different patterns, we could encourage people to create their own tutorials and their own uh, guides and stuff like that that mm -hmm. follow some of those recommendations. And then in general, the whole world of various tutorials uh, will be more coherent. Um, and I think maybe the problem there is that, you know, because yeah, because right now we have the introductory tutorial, we have the docs, and we have the guide. And I think those three things don't form a coherent story. Uh, in the sense that when you start out, you can do the beginner tutorial without really knowing anything at all. Um, but then there's definitely a gap between the end of the tutorial and the point in time when you might want to read the Meteor Guide to learn yeah. basically everything that there is to know. Yeah. Um, and that guide and that gap, I, I think, has been pretty well filled in historically by something like Discover Meteor, uh, like a more in-depth tutorial almost. Right. But that's not something that we really have right now, so I think that is a gap. But I think also the root of the of the problem is um, that when you're coming, when you're new to something, mm -hmm. um, you, you don't really want to have to or you know, some people don't really want to have to spend a lot of time to evaluate the options. And, and to do that, you have to understand what they all are. You have to yep. understand why React might be better or different or whatever than Angular. And you have to understand both of them. And you risk, mm -hmm. you feel that you risk making the wrong choice. So, so actually, that's the second reason. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you know that you're using the one thing that everybody uses, even if it may not be the best, and I'm not saying this is the, the best thinking, but I, I think it's, it's valid. Um, if, if you know that everybody's using the same thing and there are millions of people using what you're using, it's not going to die, right? So you're not going to be left using something that, is, uh, that was like the wrong choice, right? You're not going to be using beta after VHS, or you're not going to be using whatever. <laughs> oh, my analogy fell down. Whatever Blu-ray Blu killed. Yeah. Yeah, I think like the thing about it is um, it's actually, it turns out like a lot of work to be really opinionated. Um, it's actually really interesting because it's like this weird trade-off where, um, so like to, to put a, give a little background, like one thing that I've found is pretty popular recently is being like aggressively non-opinionated. Um, there's a lot of people in the, in the, programming community and like if you ever heard of these repositories that are like awesome whatever yep. like there's like awesome meteor awesome graphql awesome awesome which is like a list of awesome lists <laughs> and the whole concept behind those repositories seems to be that like everyone will be happy if you just uh, talk about every single tool and repository and post ever written about a certain topic um, and I think the the thing that's kind of kind of sad to me about that is that on the one hand, it makes everyone happy because everyone's happy that they got listed in this repository. Everyone's happy that like there's so many great projects out there. Uh, but the one person it doesn't make happy is the people who are just trying to get stuff done. Um, because now you just end up in this repository where there's seven different ways to do a certain thing and you don't know which one's better. But the thing is, like, I feel like those people are not necessarily the ones that are evangelizing the technology which is kind of like this paradox where I think there's a lot of people out there who would really appreciate having uh, a more specific path to follow uh, that is more laid out and more standardized. Um, but on the other hand, like I think the people who evangelize technology the most, who are really excited about trying out new things, different approaches, writing blog posts, uh, those people 
are excited about having lots of different options because it gives them more stuff to write blog posts about and more things to be excited about. Um, I don't know if this is like you know a negative way of phrasing it, but uh, I almost feel like you know if you try to be too opinionated, you kind of uh, it, can, it you have to be negative sometimes, and that kind of brings a whole negativity to the whole thing, right? There's people who are like, well, why isn't my package in the meteor guide, right? It's just as good as the one that you recommended, and like that may be true, right? And that's that's hard. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it totally is. But you know, it's it's really valuable for people to be able to get started without having to evaluate every possible option. So. Yeah, I think we're definitely we're definitely talking about this internally about like what are the ways that we can uh, bring some of that back, some of that experience of having like a super coherent, uh, super glued together app development experience. But it's also the world that we're in at the moment, and I, I think it would be very tough in, in I imagine it would be pretty tough in, in your situation to to pick something, right? Like are you gonna pick Angular? Are you gonna pick React? Like you're I don't think it even it doesn't make really make sense for you guys to yeah, do that like, right now. It's like Emacs yeah. versus Vim or something, right? right. <laughs> it's like if you were to guide to programming and the first step was like, you know, definitely install Vim and then like <laughs> half the people on the internet will hate you <laughs> for not picking Emacs. Uh, and it's kind of the same thing with a lot of these different technologies. All right. Well, on a similar theme, another post was the Angular versus React tutorials thread, um, and I, I don't know that I really have any any like questions about this one. I, th I think the the point of this post was that um, the Meteor Angular tutorial has less code than the React one, but React seems to be more popular, uh, yeah. at least in the Meteor world. And, and the author is wondering why. And, and I think that this is just again, you know, another person. Uh, Trying to understand why why one might be better, and think using using a metric of lines of code, which I th which I think by what that he, by I think what he means by that is just you know the amount of code the surface area of the code that you have to write. So yeah, yeah, I think it's pretty interesting. Um, I think Angular two is this thing that I don't that I should understand, but I don't. Um, because Angular 2 is kind of in an interesting place in its development process where uh, a lot of people have been working on it and trying it out, but it's not quite released yet. So it's, um, I don't know if people feel like it's quite ready to be used in production applications today. Like they released like some sort of release candidate uh, recently and I think they're working on a final release very soon. And so it's, it's possible, you know, that this is just getting started. Like, like when Angular 2 actually does come out, uh, like, will that just change the whole landscape or yeah. not? Because personally, I think it would be pretty, I mean, I don't want to like hate on anyone's strategy, but like I probably wouldn't start an app with Angular 1 today. Um, that just doesn't seem like a winning move. Yep. Uh, uh, on the other hand, it feels kind of weird to start an app with Angular 2 today as well because it's not really ready. And so, but in a world where starting an app with React or starting an app with Angular 2 is equally legit, like, I can't, I honestly can't think of any ways to pick a winner there. Um, and so, yeah, so there's kind of a question here, which is like, should we, should we pick one of the two as like the official thing, right? Like, if right now most people are using React, should we say React is now the way to go with Meteor? I don't know. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that all that was that almost happened. Like there was maybe an accidental endorsement of it um, w back when when the Blaze um, f uh, the, there was a the original post about about Blaze and there was a, some suggestion about Blaze two being maybe potentially possibly <laughs> based off of React or something. And then you know that that quickly got like you know left by yeah. the wayside. And but I you think, know, I think around that time, I think React in the wider ecosystem also just had uh, a lot of a lot of hype and a lot of traction. Yeah. And I think the reason that we thought of it that way is because um, Angular 2 is much more opinionated about stuff. So it would be pretty weird to say like, hey, we're going to build a set of layers around Angular 2. It doesn't seem to really work that way because Angular 2 is much more of a framework than React is. Uh, React, you kind of have to bring your own framework. So I think it made much more sense to us that if we want to keep a very Meteor-like developer experience, 
uh, and we just wanted to switch out the templates with something else, I think React seemed like the best choice because it's something you can just drop into a small part of your app and it doesn't really mess with the rest of your stuff. Right? With Angular, I assume you have to, you know, you have to use services, uh, you have to learn a whole new template syntax. Um, you know, that syntax is also templates, but totally different templates than what you had with Blaze. Um, so I feel like if, if the future of, of Meteor was Angular 2, it would be like the, the amount of Meteor in it would be much less uh, because Angular 2 will come with a lot of different recommendations for how to do all kinds of stuff. Well, I can't pretend to talk about Angular 2 or Angular much at all. I've, I've never built a real app with it, so. <laughs> yeah, one thing I'm really excited about is, um, is Angular and uh, Apollo because I think, I do think that Angular 2 is gonna, is gonna rise up because like I said, right now it's in like possibly the most awkward place you could be. Um, but I think it's gonna become much more attractive very, very soon. And in that world, uh, having something that will basically be like the best, the best data loading system for Angular basically period that I can imagine uh, would be pretty awesome. And if that comes from the Meteor community and uh, is also part of Meteor eventually, I think that would be really powerful. Um, and yeah, like people in the React world are super excited about GraphQL already. People in the Angular world uh, might not even be thinking about it yet. So there's a huge opportunity there, I think. Yep. Cool. All right. Um, well, I thought this would actually end up being a much shorter conversation, but it turns out we had more to talk about. Um, there was one more interesting thread, but I, I don't know that there's too much to go over unless you have anything to comment on. There was the. Uh, the oh, I, just, I just learned something while I was browsing GitHub while Zol was talking. So the, the thread that you're about to mention was the thread about allowed deny versus methods. That's it. And I actually just learned that uh, there is now a feature in Meteor 1.3.3, which is going to come out pretty soon, uh, to turn off allowed deny on a per collection basis. Cool. Uh, so we can uh, recommend that in the guide. If people feel like they don't want to use Allow Design anymore, then they can simply turn it off. Awesome. I think right now in the guide you recommend uh, setting deny rules for everything. But yeah, that would be that would be a nice, easy, an easier way of doing it. Yep. 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 Um, uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and actually, I think we we kind of undersold 1.3.3. Um, I just saw like a super super sick demo. Uh, from from Ben at our kind of weekly company check-in, that like he should uh, like record that and put it on the internet or something. But um, 1.3.3 has a lot of really interesting, uh, like small but significant changes. For example, you can bring your own Babel RC file now, and uh, you know the same way you can in other systems set up whatever JavaScript compilation rules you feel like. Uh, so if you want to use super cutting edge like class properties stuff. You can put that in your Babel RC now, um, which is a thing that people have been using some external packages for, but now will be kind of more official. And another really, really cool thing is, uh, to be beginning a bit technical, but what was really exciting for me is uh, there used to be this thing where Babel would rewrite your code when you're using imports. Babel rewrites your code in ways that actually kind of obfuscate the names of the modules. And uh, in Meteor 1.3.3, when you're debugging your code, you will actually have access to the modules that you imported in the scope that they're imported in, um, which is maybe kind of like a, a niche thing. But I guess this is one of those things that uh, you know is in danger of becoming another thing that you know you have in Meteor that you might take for granted, uh, and yet uh, we never tell anyone about. So I'm gonna I'm gonna push Ben to go and advertise that feature so that people can understand that. We actually care about small details like awesome. what your modules code transpiles to. Yeah, and, and uh, performance improvements like the, the DDP batching, that was, that's 1.3.3, isn't it? That's the big headline feature, kind of, yeah. Which is, okay. Um, yeah, I guess, I, guess that's, yeah, I guess that's a big deal. I mean, to, to me, those performance things are something like you, you don't really notice it until something, uh, until something is wrong, right? But, but yeah, that's, that's cool. Um, does that Babel RC file thing mean that you would be able to use things like async await? Well, you can already use async await in Meteor today. I did not know that. Well, 
Uh, and what's more, remember stuff like Meteor Wrap Async and Fibers and all that? Yep. Uh, on the server, async await transparently transpiles to fiber code. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of somewhere in the Meteor Guide and it's probably somewhere in the Meteor Announcement, but this is another yet another example of a thing where if you just take a, a Meteor fiber function and you take a function that returns a promise, you can use them side by side and you just throw async on there and like they work together. So, uh, so does this mean, uh, like, as a Meteor developer, you could start kind of using async await in, in all kinds of things and, and maybe not have to know so much about uh, how it's, well, maybe not care that fibers are, actually, now that I think about that, that won't really be the case. But uh, <laughs> I think in the, I think in the, future, the future that we're trying to head towards, I think, um, and I don't want to speak for Ben or Zola or anyone, um, is a future where once async await is a more supported feature, we simply get rid of fibers. So I think we're slowly migrating all of our code uh, into this async await abstraction rather than using fibers directly. It solves the same problem, making you your code a little bit more user friendly, not having to deal with callbacks and whatever, writing synchronous looking code. So yeah, that's yeah. It. and and in the in the kind of more standard and accepted way, I guess. Yep. Awesome. Well. Um, I think I only have one more thing to ask about, which is if there's anything, and this is not specifically forum related, but uh, I didn't see anything big in the forums about Apollo, but since you're the, the Apollo guy right now, now's my chance. Anything, yeah. anything exciting there? Yeah, so I think there's some really cool stuff coming up. Um, so yeah, things are changing like every, every week here. I think the biggest news this week is that we have, uh, I think probably by the time this podcast episode comes out, it will have passed already. But uh, on May 26th, which is currently tomorrow, we have a GraphQL meetup, which as far as I can tell is probably the best uh, and biggest GraphQL meetup to ever happen anywhere. Um, so we have 160 people RSVP'd. We have some speakers that are really prominent members of the Bay Area uh, GraphQL community, like, um, like the author of Graphene, Cyrus, uh, some people on the Relay team, the GraphQL team at Facebook. Um, I'll be talking about Apollo stuff there as well. Uh, so that'll be really, really exciting. I think just like starting to build a GraphQL community uh, in the Bay Area and having that be a thing that is, uh, you know, recurring and, and something that you can count on the same way you can count on Meteor Night happening, uh, I think is is going to be really, really, really cool. And uh, yeah, and another thing that we just recently launched is, um, I, but haven't yet really marketed, is a GraphQL support service. So. One thing that we learned uh, last year is immediately after we launched our Meteor Developer Subscription Service, which is basically a way for people to get uh, support for the Meteor framework directly from us, that was not only a way to make a small amount of money, um, which is, I guess, always cool, but it was just extremely informative about what people were doing, what problems they were running into, what how we should prioritize. Yep. Um, and we want to do the same thing for Apollo and for GraphQL. So we want to get in touch with people who are running it in production and uh, figure out what they're doing and how we can help them solve their problems. Uh, because I think like, you know, our, our success in the future is going to be pretty closely tied to the success of GraphQL as a platform. And so we want to make sure that we have all the tools to succeed there. That's very cool. We're, we've started using it for a couple of small things so far at OK Grow. And we actually have a, um, a meetup coming up here in, in Toronto that we're organizing in June as well. So that's, that's cool. But I'm excited to watch the live stream from tomorrow. Um, and yeah, hope, uh, probably we won't get this out before then. But uh, if anybody's listening here, you can, it'll always be on, it'll, it'll be uh, on YouTube again afterwards. So even if yeah, you miss it live, you can watch it. I think if you want to find that, we'll probably be on our website, apollostack.com, and also on our, we'll probably post that on our blog. Uh, after we have some of the recorded videos and stuff. Should be really cool. And then I'm going to go on vacation, and so I won't talk to anyone. Excellent. Well, this went longer than I planned, but thank you so much for the time. Have an awesome vacation. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, I really appreciate you uh, coming in and helping us, helping us host and coming with all these awesome questions and looking forward to more episodes. All right. Talk to you in a few weeks. Cool. Thanks.